Welcome to episode 44 of Counterthought, the attack on our children. This conversation is going to be a little bit different flow than my other episodes because this is a very serious topic. And this is a topic, in my opinion, that has come to the forefront over the past couple of weeks. And it is something that I really want to talk to you, my listeners, my viewers about. So as you know, I have two children. And if you don't know, I have two children. They're both young boys. Thankfully, with the pandemic and everything else that has gone on, they have been, I consider, too young to be heavily impacted by all the things that have had to be experienced by the older elementary school kids, the middle schoolers, the high schoolers, even college. But our children are under attack, and I need you to understand that. I don't believe that is hyperbole. Just this past week or two, you have seen there is a certain faction within the radical progressive left, the Democrat party, that is attacking our children, that is thrusting upon them sexuality before they are even ready, that there are certain people in leadership that we saw over the course of the pandemic, where it doesn't seem like they give two craps about the kids, they're concerned about the adults, and then the kids are just collateral damage. We've seen that when it comes to masking, when it comes to keeping children out of school, Even though the children and data shows this, yes, the CDC is late on it, and that is a whole different topic, but the data shows that children less spread, children, healthy children, least affected. I mean, we're talking less than a thousandth of a percent as far as deaths go related to COVID for children. There are 72 million children in the United States. They account for one-fourth, almost one-fifth of our population. And as parents, and if you are as a listener or a viewer of this podcast, I know you are over 18 because I do not broadcast this episode, these podcast episodes to, to children. So I want to believe that you or most of you can identify and relate to what exactly I am talking about. And I hope that you have seen some of these things in action with what I'm talking about. We're talking about masking during the pandemic. Initially, fine, I agree we're still feeling it out, but after a few months, not necessary. And the CDC and other government agencies didn't even take the time to do thorough studies on masking until well over a year into the pandemic. And we have seen the negative effects, the consequences that it, that has had on children and also on teachers, even though they are vaccinated, still having to wear masks and the effects that the, that is having on children, especially when it comes to speech and emotions. Children were just like an afterthought, it seemed, by some in the highest forms of highest positions of leadership. We're talking about vaccination. Vaccination for children under ages 12 years old? Why? Why? I just talked about the deaths that have been seen. Every child death is horrific. I have yet to read about a healthy child dying from COVID. So why is vaccination being pushed? There are plenty of theories out there. But why is the vaccination being pushed on our children? And why are we, in my opinion, as parents, most of us not standing up and saying more about it? I have come to gather on Instagram and through other uh, social media platforms, this community of mine, this new community of mine, and most of them, a lot of them that are parents are against vaccination of their children. Because... In my opinion, it is not necessary. And I am thankful that my kids are too young, but at my oldest, he is now starting, he is over that two, eight, two-year-old two age threshold. Thankfully, Governor DeSantis is standing up for these children, but that is not stopping the pharmaceutical companies or other government health agencies in recommending vaccination for two years old and up. Two years old and up. I just did the math prior to this episode. 
There are about 1,300 COVID, COVID-related deaths for children. That number could be lower because the CDC has admitted that they did they had the wrong tracking. They did not track the data well. States didn't track the data well. There's a difference between dying from COVID and with COVID. But I did the math, 1,300 divided by 72 million, 75 million children in the United States as of the 2020 census. And the result, if you were to write it out on a piece of paper, is 0.0000005% of children. There is a numerous list of other things that children do daily in their life, like riding in a car with their parents, walking to school, playing outside in the rain, sliding on a slide, tumbling around on the jungle gym that has a higher death rate than COVID-19. Yet vaccinations are still being pushed by pharmaceuticals, and I believe it's purely for money. A lot out there say there are other reasons for that, and that could also be true. But it's not for the benefit of the child. There's no longitudinal data on vaccination for children related to COVID-19. It is just unnecessary. There is no scientific data to back it up, but it is still being pushed. So as a parent, are you standing up for your child? I'm going to stand up for mine. That My boys do not need it. I don't care if I have to pull them out of school, if this is going to continue to be pushed, they're not getting it. And then we saw in Virginia of last year, critical race theory. I have not talked about critical race theory on this podcast. I'm not going to go into it a whole lot here right now. But to me, there are two, there are two different levels or categories of critical race theory. There is critical race theory that acknowledges that, you know, or not acknowledge, that's the wrong term, because when I grew up and was going through American history, we we did acknowledge, you know, slavery in this country. We learned about that. I remember doing reports on um different figures during during those times who stood up to slavery, you know, the, the um, abolitionists <clears throat> and so on and so forth. So to me, there are two categories. There is the let's fully acknowledge everything that went on during those times, what white people like myself did during those times. And then there is the next category, which is beyond that, which wants to say, based on that, you now today as a child are considered a racist. And that is, that is false. Passing along the sins, potential sins, sorry, not potential sins, because not everyone owns slaves, to just make this blanket generalization that because of your skin color, your race, that you need to be considered racist because of something that happened 160 years to 200 years to 300 years before your time? No. But that is being pushed by the radical progressive left. And in the state of Virginia, that was culminated in Governor Yunkin being elected to office. The parents had had enough. Parents in Virginia, parents in California, parents in Michael. Tennessee, and I'm sure every other state or almost every other state has stood up against that radical category, that radical teaching that lives within critical race theory. That is an attack on our children. Children are like sponges. They absorb everything. They think very literally, especially up to or through age five years old. As a story, I was talking to my four-year-old a couple of weeks ago. I am a graduate of the University of Florida. My parents went there. My siblings went there. It is a family affair. Now, I took him, well, my family and I, my wife and I, my dad was also there, took him to his first Florida Gator football game this past fall. I mean, he was excited. His first football game ever in person. He was decked out in the orange and blue. He had his shirt, his hat. Um, One of his great aunts 
my aunt gave him a sticker to put on his cheek. I mean, he looked adorable and handsome and cute and all those things. And during that game, the excitement on his face, I thought he was, I thought he was converted and he's going to be a gator for life. Well, my gators didn't have that great of a season, unfortunately. So he gravitated over to my wife's team, the University of Georgia, who happened to win the national championship this year. Boo. But he did that. And then I was teasing him one day, talking about, oh, wh why don't you want to be a gator? Alligators are so much bigger than bulldogs. Bulldogs, what, they are maybe two and a half feet long maximum. I don't even know how much they weigh. They're stocky. You know, they're short. They're little to the ground. They're, they're a bulldog, right? It's like an alligator could easily eat a bulldog. I mean, a food chain. Wouldn't you want to be the bigger, stronger gator that can get up to 13, 14 feet long with jaws as big as the bulldog itself and chop down with all of that power? And because he is four years old and they take four year olds take things very literally. He could not comprehend or imagine what I was talking about. That I was talking about, you know, just seeing in your mind and knowing that this alligator and this bulldog, if they were to fight, the alligator is going to win. So when I was describe, he couldn't picture that. So when I was describing this scenario, he was taking it literally. And because he identifies as a bulldog, he started getting upset because he thought I was talking about an alligator actually eating him. He thought I was talking about an alligator actually eating him because that is the child's brain at that age. So to send children to school and schools and trying to put on popular term, indoctrinate children into sexual beliefs, is not acceptable. That is what has happened this past two weeks with, with Disney in the state of Florida, where I live. House Bill HB 1557 was signed into law last week by Governor DeSantis. And it says that a child, that a school cannot subject a child, cannot put upon a child like sexual conversations, conversations about sex or gender identity between grades kindergarten through third, ages five through eight years old, or can't have conversations with children that are beyond what is developmentally appropriate for the child. And that blew up, right? That came up and it was then labeled the don't say gay bill. Gay was never in there. It doesn't even talk about sexual orientation. It just says you can't talk about it because the children are not ready. They're not developmentally ready in their mind for these types of conversations. And then again, the radical progressive left is up in arms about this, advocating that these should be okay conversations and teachers turning themselves into the victims, making it all about themselves. Like, Oh, I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to talk to my students now. I mean, what am I going to say to them? There's nothing in that bill that says you can't talk about your weekend. If you happen to be part of the LGBTQ community, but it also, it doesn't say that you can't have that conversation, but it says you cannot be talking about sex, biological sex, sexual orientation with children that is not developmentally appropriate. And it specifically calls out kindergarten through third grade. But everyone that doesn't read the bill or just wants to be intellectually dishonest is taking it as some kind of attack on the LGBT, LGBTQ, I think it's I plus community. No, it's not about that. And that is a really weird hill that you want to die on. That's the one you want to die on. That's the one that Disney wants to die on. Thankfully, there are reports now that the silent majority within Disney who supports this bill is starting to speak up and gather momentum within the company saying like, yo, hey, we're here. This small faction of the company does not speak for us. You are not representing us. CEO Chapik, when you said the things that you said over the past two weeks and how you're going to fight to bring down this bill and the lawsuits that have already started, started uh, flooding in. I don't know about necessarily from Disney, but from other, um, other groups within the state of Florida and nationally bringing lawsuits against the state of Florida regarding this bill. 
but we need to protect our children. And as a Christian, I cannot stand for this, for these teachings. As a Christian, the Bible says <clears throat> in Psalm 127.3 that children are a gift from God. They are a gift from the Lord. Proverbs 22.6, and this goes to the, I believe, to the core of everything that I am talking about of why these children need to be protected because they are like sponges. Your brain is not fully developed until you are 25 years old. And these children, and whether it's masking, are being used as guinea pigs and seen as collateral damage. There are now documentation that there are in studies showing that there are speech delays, cognitive delays in children because of masks that they had to wear and also that their teachers had to wear, even though the teachers were around the kids who are the least likely to transmit vectors of transmission and also the uh, teachers being vaccinated. And now our kids and not just little school age children, but also middle schoolers and high schoolers are behind a year to two years, depending on the amount of school they were able to complete remotely or in classroom or some kind of hybrid. But the Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6, that you need to start your children off in the way they should go. And even when they are old, they will not depart from it. So I can't stand up for these teachings that are trying to be thrust upon them as a Christian. I cannot stand for that. And if you don't think masking was a big deal, let me let me go back to some of the um, statistics that I shared, the, the the data that I shared in episode thirty, uh, episode twenty nine, the mental health epidemic within teenagers. I want you to listen to this. According to the 2020 census, there are 24 million teenagers in the United States of America. 24 million out of the 72 total million. So one third of all children are teenagers according to the 2020 census. The pandemic caused kids to miss out on school dances, graduation ceremonies, in-person learning, hanging out with friends, sports, extracurricular activities, clubs, you know, clubs through school and other things. They could have also lost a loved one and not be able to see them in the hospital. And in 2020, June 2021, it is estimated that as of June 2021, more than 140,000 children in the United States had lost a parent or grandparent caregiver to COVID-19. And a lot of them were not even able to see their, their grandparents or their parent in the hospital because of certain restrictions. And then add on top of that, that lockdowns are considered the root cause of mental health epidemic issues in teenagers. Lockdowns took school away from the teens. School is one fourth of a student's day for five days a week. The educational aspects, the social aspects, gone. Lockdowns also kept teens from seeing their friends. And then you have the teachers unions, the two largest ones in the most the one talked about the most is led by Randy Weingarten. I believe she is in AFT, the American Federation of Teachers, has more than 1.4 million members, and that includes teachers between pre-K, preschool, and 12th grade. And her union and the CDC were caught in cahoots with one another for setting back-to-school guidelines. And Randy Weingart is on record saying that she does not want her teachers in the classroom or without masks or students without masks until there is a COVID zero. Well, that's not happening. So she represents the teachers. I understand that. But aren't her teachers, isn't she also supposed to represent and, and advocate for the education of the children? She certainly didn't do that. Wanting to keep children masked up and to protect her teachers, teachers who once they had the vaccination were at a severe or highly less risk of contracting or not con of being hospitalized or dying from COVID. No thoughts, no, 
no craps given, so to speak, about the children. No, no care about how all of this negatively affected them. According to, this is, I believe, is, if I remember correctly from my episode, episode 29 is coming from the Surgeon General's report. One in five children ages three to 17 in the United States have a reported mental, emotional, developmental, or behavioral disorder. In 2016, of the 7.7 million children with a treatable mental health disorder, about half did not receive adequate treatment. Between 2011 and 2015, youth psychiatric visits to emergency rooms for depression, anxiety, and behavioral challenges increased from 2011 to 2015, four years increased by 28%. And between 27, 2007 and 2018, suicide rates among kids ages 10 to 24 increased by 57%. And this is all leading up to the pandemic. And then you add on top of the pandemic and what it did to children. 80,000 youth across the world found that depressive and anxiety symptoms doubled during the pandemic with 25% of the youth experiencing depressive symptoms and 20% experiencing anxiety symptoms. In early 2021, emergency department visits in the United States for suicide attempts were 51% higher for adolescent girls and 4% higher than adolescent boys compared to early in 2019. And then the early estimates from the National Center of Health Statistics suggest that there are more than 6,600 deaths by suicide between ages 10 to 24 in 2020. Mental health was bad before the pandemic, got worse, was exacerbated by the pandemic. And a lot of that has to do with not adjusting to the science as it was received whether that is on whether that was on purpose by the leaders in place across different organizations or i guess just being stupid being an idiot leader thinking that you know better than the true science and look at the effects that it had on our older children And then jumping back to the sexualization of children at a too young of an age, there is this organization within Canada, and I, I think I believe it's called All About Kids or All About Kids Health. And it breaks down the proper, I guess, they consider what they consider to be the proper mental development of children starting from zero to 24 months to two to four years from five to eight years old, from nine to 12 years old, as it relates to conversations and understandings of sexuality. Well, this organization said that for kids ages two No, ages five to eight years old. So this is the same age group as the the Florida bill, HB 1557, the Florida law now, sorry, not bill, Florida law, ages five to eight years old. This organization is saying that children should have a full understanding of heterosexuality, homosexuality, bisexuality. They should understand that there are multiple genders. I think the number is around 66 now in the world. They should know that when they are online on a tablet or a computer or whatever on a phone, that if they see certain images, they need to, to look away they, that they should not be posting certain sexual images to the internet. I don't know what kind of parents are letting their kids be online (laughs) at that age or even having their own phones or, or tablets with permissions allowed for them to be able to post that stuff. But this organization is talking about how 
kids at that age are, you know, discovering their body and that we need to have conversations with them to let them know that that's okay between ages five and eight years old. Five and eight years old, they want them to know that there is heterosexuality, homosexuality, bisexuality, all of these different genders that go along with it. Five to eight years old, why? I didn't know that stuff between five and eight years old and I know about it now. So what's the rush? Are they preying upon our kids? Is that the only way to accomplish? Is that, is that, their, fo- is that their way to accomplish their goal? If you look at the rise in transgenderness, transgenderism within our country, it has been on a drastic incline, a drastic increase over the last 10 to 15 years. And why is that? Could it be because children are being mentally abused and this stuff is being pushed upon them? And because children do not have, are not at the right developmental age, they're not fully comprehending what they're being told, but because they are sponges, they are absorbing this. And almost as if the scripture that I read from the Bible, where you need to raise your children up according to the the word of God, and then even when they're old, they will not depart from it. Are they taking that same proverb, proverb 22, 6, and then turning it into being the sexualization of children? Is that what's going on here? So I'll be damned. <laughs> I'll be damned if that's going to happen to my kids. If I heard one one mention from my boys as they're going through school that some some teacher or some leader in whatever they're involved in is trying to share this information with them at an inappropriate age, or actually share with them at all, because as a parent, my wife and I, we should be the ones having conversations. We as parents are trusting our kids to you as a teacher, to you as a baseball coach, a music teacher, whatever the kids are involved in. We are entrusting you. We are giving you permission to watch over our kids and teach them something in education, a skill, while we are not there. We are entrusting you to do that. We are not, that is not the stamp seal of approval saying, hey, you can do whatever you want. No. Blinders. If you're a teacher, you are to educate the kids. Science, math, reading, writing, art, language. You are not to talk to them about anything else than that, unless it is the school-sanctioned sexual education at the appropriate development age. This is not something you don't get to just inject your own beliefs, practices into my kids' life, into your kids' lives, because you have them with you for six to eight hours a day. No. That is not what we as parents, what I as a parent am entrusting you to do. So it is time to protect our children. It is time to stand up against the evils in this world that are trying to take advantage and strip away the innocence of our children. If you are a parent, it is beyond time for you and I to stand up to this. I am thankful that my boys are, I consider almost too young to be exposed to this. My four-year-old's getting right there at the cusp of that that, uh, kindergarten age. My youngest, not so much, thankfully. But for those of you out there who have kids who are in elementary school, who are in middle school, who are in high school, you probably have had some sort of experience with this and I can't imagine what it must be like to to see your child go through that and to experience that with them. And I hope and I pray that you have shielded your children as much as possible from this evil that is being thrust upon them. Please, 
hear me. Our kids are the most vulnerable and just like a lion on the plains in Africa. They go after the weakest antelope, the weakest wildebeest, the most vulnerable, because that is what they can get their claws on and that is what can be devoured. So protect your children, protect their innocence, raise them up according to the word of God so that when they are older, they will not depart from it. Thank you for listening to episode 44 of Counterthought. Remember to subscribe to the channel and to like this video. And also you can check out this video or this video for more Counterthought.